on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. As hunters, we're really concerned that if we give an inch, they're going to take a mile. But on the other side, we need to find a way to say, you're welcome at the table. How do we get seen as part of the outdoor recreation world and not like this weird subcategory? Is there enough game and is there enough opportunity out there for everybody who wants to be self-sufficient? Opportunity isn't just how many animals are on the landscape either. It's like socioeconomic, it's access. There is this deep reverence for these animals that we pursue. You can't understand in any way except in that firsthand personal account. We're having extremely meaningful interactive relationships with other than human beings, the non-human world. There's something about the experience, something that surrounds it that can be appreciated by all. And I think at its core, hunting has that. Episode 118 of the Wild Fed Podcast, a hunting dialectic with Everett Headley, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Why just survive when you could thrive? SirThrival.com is your source for nature-based nutritional supplements that keep you thriving in the modern world. From hormone health to immune support, increased metabolism to exercise recovery, Sir Thrival keeps you thriving when others are just surviving. Check out their pine pollen pure potency for testosterone support, colostrum for a smoothie ingredient that's three times more effective against the flu than vaccines, elk antler for powerful growth and recovery, medicinal mushrooms for immunomodulation and powerful antioxidant capability, and vitamin D3 for all the protective properties you've been hearing about during this pandemic. Go to SirThrival.com to see the entire lineup and use the coupon code WILDFED for 5% off your order. Sir Thrival. Why just survive when you could thrive? If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can now stream all 10 episodes on demand at MyOutdoorTV.com. MyOutdoorTV.com is Outdoor Channel's premium online subscription service. They host thousands of episodes of hunting and fishing content, making this a great subscription service for anyone interested in the outdoors. But if you just want to see Wild Fed, grab yourself a free trial subscription and then check out all 10 episodes at no charge. If you decide to keep it, it's just $9.99 a month. A month. We're currently in production for season two of Wild Fed, which is shaping up to be an awesome season of new episodes, and they'll start premiering on the Outdoor Channel in 2022. Hey, thanks again for all your incredible support. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. I set out to interview today's guest, Everett Headley, on the topic of falconry, cooperative hunting with a bird of prey. He's a Montana resident that, amongst other things, hunted with a red-tailed hawk and is now training a peregrine falcon. All very interesting stuff that I've wanted to learn about for years. But from the moment we started speaking, it was obvious to me that the natural flow of our conversation was going in a different direction. Both Everett and myself take a very philosophical approach to hunting and understanding our relationship to the outdoors and the wild things that live there. And this, being our initial conversation, quickly took a turn toward the big picture. What we landed on was a conversation about the journey a hunter takes over the course of their lifetime and how we think we can best preserve our hunting heritage in perpetuity. It's an important topic because despite the renewed cultural interest we're seeing in hunting right now, there are many forces still aligned against it. And while in recent years many new hunters are embracing the lifestyle, we have a long way to go to win over the non-hunting public. Everett is a really thoughtful person and it comes through in how he communicates about the lifestyle he passionately lives. He really takes his time in exploring these ideas and has a deep grasp on the topic of hunting, not just how to, but the why and when. And by when, I mean where we are currently in the timeline of modern hunting and its relationship to conservation. I love conversations like this, true dialectics, where many questions are asked, but neither of us has an answer to the questions we're posing. Instead, we explore them with a sincere desire to arrive at sound conclusions. Whether or not you agree with those conclusions is less important than that these ideas get explored. Because, 
as I'm always want to point out, hunting isn't just some other hobby like building model cars or playing racquetball. It's the natural, fundamental human food acquisition strategy, and it's formative to how we came to be in relationship to the rest of the ecosystem and the other than human beings that inhabit them alongside us. Therefore, while many fads will come and go, some in the course of our lifetime, hunting must, in my opinion, remain. It's too important to who we are to see it lost or forgotten or tread beneath the wheels of the great engine of so-called progress. So it's in that spirit that Everett and I are having this conversation. It's a desire to see something fundamentally human preserved. And I promise to bring him back to talk about falconry soon, as I'm as interested to learn about that as you are. In the meantime, get to know Everett a bit and take some time to consider these questions yourself, because we need all hands on deck. Everett Headley, welcome to the show. Thanks, Daniel. Hey, man, I'm really excited to uh, meet and talk to you today. You know, it seems like you've got a lot going on. You're a really dynamic dude. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, all the things that you do and, and what your background is with, you know, hunting and, and fishing the outdoors and all that. Well, you know, I, I'm one of those guys who's really blessed to be able to just chase passion and not have to worry about um, too much about paying the bills. I have to worry more about keeping the wife happy and, and staying married <laughs> when I'm gone for so long. But I do wear a lot of hats and, and uh, love to be involved in all the different conservation groups and activities and, and uh, causes that I am. And falconry is uh, definitely a big part of that. Yeah, this is what I really, you know, I'm hoping to focus on today is falconry, but I, I don't want people to get the idea that that's all you're a part of, because it looks to me like, you know, just scrolling through your Instagram account, you know, I see you hunting antelope, I see you out fishing, I see you, you know, looks like you get into elk. And so it, lo- it looks like you you get a, into a, a pretty broad range of outdoor pursuits. And then also with a some kind of a background in outdoor education stuff as well. Yeah. So, you know, in Montana, I like to say there's really no off season, you know, it's, yeah. um, you know, during the summer where we pick up a fly rod and we chase, you know, trout through the cold water and then archery season comes into play with big game and it's a rifle and then into ducks. And then during the winter, you know, wolves and lions are, are out there and you start tracking those. And then maybe in March you get a little bit of a break, but that's really application season. Uh, begins <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so yeah. and then April, May, you get in at bears and turkeys and it starts all over again. So no shortage for me of spending my time uh, in the outdoors. I think I spend in excess of a couple hundred days every year uh, trying to be off the grid, out in the woods, out in the water, doing something like that. That's awesome. And then what kind of stuff do you focus? Tell us about the podcast and what kind of stuff you focus on there. Yeah, I did uh, start this new platform uh, late last year. I've uh, been involved in, in outdoor education, and, and that's really my what my passion is. I love taking uh, adult onset hunters out, people who have not hunted before, getting them uh, uh, into gear and just into the traditions of hunting and then putting them on their, their first hunt and helping them find a success um, that way for them. I, I love doing that kind of thing, and, and I just like talking about hunting. And so for me, you know, uh, there's, there's really this passion to help other people experience, uh, wildlife and wild places like I have. And, and so through Venery and Veritas, which is my podcast and my platform, that's really what we focus on. It's a little bit more philosophical in, in nature. So, you know, recently we've just talked about the five stages of the sportsman from Dr. Robert Norton and, he wrote this study about 30 years ago with 5,000 hunters and why do they hunt and what are the traditions behind it. And so we looked at that and kind of pulled that apart a little bit. And, and we really focus uh, on uh, those types of, of aspects of hunting. So the stories, the, the recollections of the old timers, the sitting around a campfire as a little boy, listening to the older guys talk about it and wanting to be like them and have those successes. And the, energy and effort that they put in to find those successes without the aid of things like GPS and range finders and Gore-Tex <laughs> and, and doing yeah. it uh, the, the real old school way. And so um, I've really tried to capture that. And if you're looking for, you know, 10 ways to kill a, a big buck, probably not going to find it, but if you want to know <laughs> 10 things about why hunting big bucks is challenging. You might find something more like that along my style. So that's really what I'm trying to do. And, and, you know, um, it's a, it's a passion project like everything else I do. So not going to be a millionaire from it, but really don't care. I just, I love doing, and I love doing the, uh, the interviews and talking to people about these kinds of things. And, and so, um, as long as 
long as I guess there's uh, internet and electricity, I'll, I'll probably keep doing it. I, I'm having a, a great time doing it. You know, I want to, I don't want to gloss over cause you brought up that, that stages of a, of a hunter's journey there. I, I, I'm curious if you'd flesh that out for our listeners, just, uh, it's a really interesting topic. And when I, I'm, you know, an adult onset hunter myself, I, I was like kind of resistant to that in the beginning. Cause you know, it's like, you know, being a white belt or whatever. And now I see things changing for myself. Um, as I've had more, you know, gotten more experience and, and had the opportunity to do a lot more things and, uh, kind of, you know, coming back to that, it's like, yeah, that's, that's real. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, yeah. just curious if you want to share, uh, with folks, um, a little bit about that. Yeah, I totally can. I'm not the, the authority on it for sure, but you know, in my research and study, this guy, Dr. Uh, Robert Norton kind of popped up and, uh, everybody's kind of, if you've taken a hunter ed class, you, you've heard it, it's kind of ingrained in all that kind of education, the five stages of a sportsman. And I kind of came at it, uh, through the back door and, and was just kind of researching some of these hunting educators and hunting researchers who, you know, I, I read their papers and kind of nerd out a little bit on, uh, these, these really long dissertations and look for the nuggets that are in there. And, uh, I came across Dr. Norton and he was a psychologist at the University of Wisconsin. And in the seventies, he surveyed about 5,000 hunters. And what he was looking for were common themes to the reasons behind why they hunt. And he was really trying to, to nail down some of these ideas so that he could really just figure out what was going on behind the, the, the ethos of a hunter. And so through was that, he a hunter and, himself, you know? Um, yeah, he like was. What, what motivated this? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, the background on him was he he had hunted for decades in Wisconsin. It was a, a generational thing with him. He took his family out, and so it, you know, again, probably a passion project for him as well. And uh, really, not a lot of that kind of research had been done <clears throat> on um, on why people were hunting. And so when he kind of started to pick up the mantle, it was really uh, in, in the hunting world, groundbreaking research. And what he found was five different stages that people kind of progress through. And like anything else, it's not black and white. There's a generality to it where you can be fluid through one or two stages and, and moving your way into one and still kind of um, having pieces of the, the, the previous one to it. But that first stage <clears throat> is called the shooting stage. And, and really, it's just about putting bullets out there. <laughs> and, and getting that opportunity yeah. to, to pull the trigger. And, you know, for, for new hunters and people who have never fired a gun before, I think there's a lot of fear and uh, apprehension about pulling that trigger for the first time. But the second time and the third time and the thousandth time, you, you probably can't stop them as long as there's bullets in the box. It's, it's a lot of fun to be able to do that. And when you're out hunting and being able to put those skills into play, you want every opportunity to do that, right? And so your first stage, that that shooting stage, you're really just trying to get out there, find your target, and pull the trigger. And that kind of progresses into the second stage really naturally because once you've had that first taste of success, you want that next stage, right? And so they get into the limit stage. And now if you've got two tags, you're trying to fill two tags. If you have a daily limit of five birds, you're trying to shoot five birds and really trying to maximize that experience. And, and I, I really identify with this one because when I was a kid and I shot my first deer, it was this awe kind of inspiring, like I finally did it. You know, I've watched my dad do it. I've had multiple times when I failed and finally it's now happened. And, and you want to have that same type of experience. And a lot of people talk about, you know, the moment that they stop feeling something like that when they're out hunting, that's the time that they, they hang it up. Right. And so we all as hunters kind of identify with that idea. And well, when you get that first taste of it and everything's still new to you, you want it more. And so that second stage of limiting out, you're just trying to, to, to fill more and more. And, and at this point, you're not unconcerned with conservation. You're probably just uneducated um, about it. And, and it's not something that you, you would hold against that, that hunter, but it's just, this is where they are in that phase of life. It's like when we're all kind of teenagers and we, we do dumb things. And as adults, we kind of look back on it. We're like, oh, you know, probably shouldn't have done that. But, you know, when you're a teenager, you're not really aware of those kinds of things. And that's kind of where that second limit stage comes in. And then he moves into the, the third stage, the trophy stage. So once you've had that success, now you want to find 
those those larger animals or those animals that are more of a challenge to to find. And um, I think a lot of people kind of stop here at the trophy stage. Um, they find the success. They figure out how to to find patterns and kind of unlock the secrets to finding those bigger animals. And that's kind of where they stay. And, you know, with, with the advent of social media and things like that, it's easier to do that when, you know, those bigger deer get more likes. Right. And so they kind of just, you know, this is where they stay. But what, what Dr. Norton really found was that those who progress to the fourth and the fifth stages of sportsmen really have more satisfaction and fulfillment in what they're doing. And so that fourth oh, stage, the, meth, the method stage, these are the guys that, okay, I've, I've had success with a rifle. Now I'm going to move into, you know, archery equipment. Once you've had success with those, uh, as a friend of mine likes to say, the training wheels with compound bows, you take the training wheels off and, and then you get into stick bows and self bows and, um, you know, maybe recurves and, and you you increase that challenge just a little bit, or maybe you go the other way. And uh, this past year, I finally picked up a, a muzzle loader and found a, a totally traditional percussion 50 cal. <laughs> oh, cool. And, and had a lot of fun. On your Instagram, I think, of the uh, mechanism. Yeah. Well, so, my, you know, Montana here, we just got a muzzle loader season this past year. And I had, I had dabbled in it before and shot other guys' uh, muzzle loaders and you just had never had, um, really time or opportunity to do it. And so this past year I drew uh, an antelope muzzleloader tag in Idaho. And of course that really uh, put me in, into the ball, you know, into the game to, to find one. And I ended up buying a, a Lyman Great Plains Hunter that I shoot conicals out of. And I found what I think was the only one in the entire country that was for wow. sale. <laughs> I had gone on the websites and, and search and, and, I had contacted Lyman directly and, and asked for a, a shipping manifest. And so they gave me the past three months of where they had shipped one out and I'm calling all these stores and it's, you know, mom and pop store deep heart South of Missouri before I found one. And, and she, she didn't really think that I, she could ship the gun through the, uh, through the mail, you know, cause with the modern rifles, you have to have an FFL, but with the muzzle loader, you didn't. And so trying to explain to her what I needed to do and how I wasn't just some, weirdo trying to buy a gun over the internet. Uh, it was, it was <laughs> right. an experience for her, yeah. but I got one and developed my load. And, and it was just, it was so much fun being in touch with this primitive type of, of hunting. And I wrote an article uh, about hunting antelope with the muzzleloader. And I, I hearkened back to the days when Lewis and Clark and the core discovery came through Montana and this is what they were doing. And, and so yeah. being connected with 200 years of hunting history um, added an element that made the hunt that much more rich and exciting. And, um, you know, I name my, my guns really kind of a uh, more of, of just a, I don't know, a joke than anything. It's not a, something I take real serious, but it, it, you have to blood the gun right before you, you can name it kind of like you can't name a car until you get four four wheels off the ground. Right. So uh, <laughs> the, the, an, the antelope hunt in, uh, in Idaho was this little love triangle going on with this, uh, you know, older buck, younger buck in the stow. And they were kind of all, you know, focused on each other. And I was finally able to get, uh, you know, about a 50 yard shot on, on the bigger buck. And, and, and I named the, the, the muzzle or Casanova. So that's, <laughs> that's that um, story. But, you know, going back to the method stage, that's what people, um, in that, in that stage, that's what they're looking for. Those different experiences and those different challenges that just add to the history, the, um, the ethos, just the, the passion of hunting. And those guys will er eventually graduate into what, uh, Dr. Norton called the sportsman stage. And that sportsman stage is really where you have kind of been there, done that and seen it enough that you want other people to bring it on. And these are really the people who, uh, continue our hunting heritage, right? They're the ones that teach hunter ed. They're the ones that take kids out. They're the ones that are passing on for the next generation to, to figure out, um, what hunting is to them and, and what it looks like for them. And, and, and so when I, started to look at this hunting development theory. I was talking to this old game warden and he, he's kind of getting up there a little bit grayer in days and he'd be okay with me telling this, but you know, at some point he's soon, he's going to have to hang it up because he just can't physically do it anymore. And, and the thought of that really, um, really disappoints him, but 
the idea that he can then give back to kids in teaching them things really um, keeps him energized about it. But he asked the question, you know, what happens when all these old guys hang it up and, mm. and their knowledge is now gone? And how do we as a hunting community begin to preserve and capture all that very hard won hunting knowledge? And it, it's something that really made me stop and think. And so that's why I've kind of been digging into the hunter development theory a little bit more. Yeah, that's interesting to me too, as somebody who's had to find a lot of mentors, um, I, I'd say typically for every discipline that I've wanted to be a part of. So when I decided to start hunting, you know, it was really food motivated, but but it was like, okay, there's a lot of different, I want a variety on my menu here. So it was like one after the other, after the other, having to find folks like that who yeah, we're at a stage where they were more interested in giving back than they were, um, in their, the pursuit themselves at that time. And, and, uh, so I like, when you bring, when you start talking about that phase, it's like, I get a little warm fuzzy because I think of all these people who've really went out of their way to help me and, uh, yeah. continue to, you know, I mean, just awesome. Um, how it's difficult like as a was personal that? development strategy, you know, I was just going to ask how difficult was that for you to find people like that? You know, I find that it's it's more difficult for a lot of the people who come to me asking me how to do it than it was for me. Um, you know, I, I think being an outgoing person, being charismatic, um, not not being afraid to fail, not being afraid to ask questions. Um, you know, I I always tell this story about uh, you know, I my first big game hunt was for bear uh, over hounds, and um, you know, I met this this kind of old timer at the gas station. He just had a, a truck full of dogs, and I just struck up a conversation with him, and you know, and he gave me a phone number, and before I know it, we were fast friends, and you know, he walked my wife down the aisle ultimately. Um, oh, so wow. it was like you know, it I just approach people, um, and uh, you just got you know. But for, for a lot of folks, that's difficult to do, um, especially if they're kind of a lot of the folks who are drawn to my work are pretty counterculture people and they don't fit them. They don't look like or fit the mold. You know, this new demographic of, of people coming into hunting. You know, I keep joking with older friends of mine. I go, how are you going to feel about it when kids with face tattoos want to start hunting? You know, because like that's the next generation who's going to be right. coming into it. It's like, you, you know, it, they're not going to look the way it looked when you were a kid or it looked 10 years ago, it's like going to change really fast. So, um, you know, I, I, it's been fun for me to break down some of those barriers because I, I come through looking a lot different than a lot of the folks these people have hunted with. And, uh, so I think I'm always a little exotic for them. And like, in a sense, they've always been a little kind of exotic to me <laughs> because I didn't grow up around it, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's challenging, but I, I, I've, I've found it quite, you know, uh, eye opening to meet some of these characters. Cause I think I had a lot of stereotypical ideas about what they would be like. And, uh, they've been some of the greatest people I've met. So, and I think I part would of like the to hear some time. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go. I was just going to say, I would like to hear what, what, what stereotypes you were thinking of, um, when you were coming into it. Yeah. What I think a lot of that kind of, that kind of FUD thing, you know, my mind had been, cla you know, I growing up sort of, not meaning to be, but just the culture that I was in. I mean, hunting was like not, it wasn't even something on my radar. The the weirdest thing ever is like, I've always been interested in wild food as far back as I can remember. So I was a forager for, you know, most of my life. And, uh, somehow I, this just sound like when I say this, this sounds so absurd that I like, can't, it's like hard to utter it out loud, but I did not see hunting as a method of getting wild foods. I saw hunting as some other, like my mind had just been so clouded by, you know, cultural biases against hunting. And so, you know, I grew up without a dad. Um, so, I, you know, I didn't have that like patrilineal thing of, you know, people who did this. So yeah, I had to really, uh, I had to really sort through a lot of things in my mind <laughs> in order to get there. You know, I know that sounds weird, but it's like, well, I, you know, I, I ask about that because, um, you know, understanding all these uh, stereotypes coming into hunting really helps us as hunters to be able to better communicate what we want to, to the, that, that community that's not hunting. Right. And I think mm -hmm. about those kinds of things. Cause again, my passion, adult onset hunters. So these are people who, you know, for whatever reason, they're just kind of randomly picking up hunting and, and they don't have that, that family heritage to kind of bring them into it. And so they have all these ideas and they don't understand, you know, that we have regulations that we have, yep. 
uh, yeah. hunter ed they don't you know there's these safeguards to hunting that that really show our our care and, and compassion for the animals that we we eventually harvest and and you bring up that word FUD and that's really what a lot of people think of. And, you know, you know, I love Looney Tunes, but maybe, maybe by design, <laughs> by desi- that was by design, you know, at that, I think at that time, I mean, there was a big push in, in media to, to caricaturize and demonize hunters. I mean, you know, make them look oh, stupid you're not and wrong. backward. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I do think it's changing. I mean, you must be seeing a tremendous influx of, of new folks with, with, probably I would imagine food and nature connection being two of the bigger, you know, like what are the things people are telling you they reasons that they want to hunt? Because it seems to me that the, the pursuit of, uh, hunting as like a, I don't know, a way of challenging yourself or proving things to yourself like that, you know, that kind of thing seems to have like, seems to like leave a bad taste in people's mouth currently. You know, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm, I was, I was just talking with some folks about this at a dinner the other night that, we had a, a beaver dinner for the Wild Fed Show, uh, season two coming up here. And and so we're all sitting around talking about it. And I was saying how uh, it's interesting that the idea of hunting for sport was a correction in thinking because the market hunt had driven populations of animals to extir- extirpation and had, had just knocked down animal populations so much that people were like, we can't hunt for food anymore. We have to get away from this. So hunting became a, a pursuit of leisure and a sport. And then today we're at this point where people don't like that idea. Like if you bring up the idea of hunting as a sport, people are like kind of turned off. They want it to be about food, but not realizing that this is like a cyclic thing we've been through. <laughs> You know, and yep. it doesn't make sense. And so without like the historical context, you know, you, if you try to say to somebody today, that, oh, I hunt for leisure, or I hunt for sport, they might take that kind of like offensively, not understanding that that was a solution to a huge problem that led to, you know, the loss of the passenger pigeon, for example. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, hunting is as ancient as humanity itself. And through most of our history, it wasn't just a physical pursuit, but it was also a spiritual one. It was one of the ways human beings came to understand ourselves and how to reverently approach the animals that would come to sustain us. Hunting is still an incredible tool for personal transformation, helping you discover more about yourself, your environment, the animals you share the world with, and even helping you develop a deeper understanding of life and death itself. Hunting can help you find your place in the community of life. But you could hunt all your life and never find that kind of transformation. It takes deliberate practice, awareness, and sometimes even initiation. That's why my friend Monsal Dentic created SacredHunting.com. Sacred Hunting brings new or experienced hunters out onto the landscape to stalk, harvest, and field dress animals in a retreat-type setting in conjunction with sweat lodges, plant medicine ceremonies, and strong intention setting that prepares hunters for a lifelong spiritual relationship with themselves, the land, and the animals they hunt. Last time I was in Texas for a hunt, Motzel came out to hold ceremony for me as a way of deepening the experience, creating more reverence for the land, and of course, as a way of honoring the animals we'd be harvesting. That's the piece that's so often missing in modern hunting, a piece that many hunters would like to restore. If this is what you're after or you want to learn more, check out sacredhunting.com. Monsell and his team will guide you through beginner hunts and more experienced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe, like access deer hunts on Molokai in Hawaii and even a northern Siberia hunt with the Nenets people coming up in 2022. There's only a few spots available for each hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available if you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fed podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and you can learn more about Monsell and Sacred Hunting on episode 59 of the Wild Fed podcast. Now, back to the show. You know, what you bring up there is is so poignant to, to the cause of hunting where the history and where we've been and what we have um, kind of fought for is is largely gone and and unknown to, to just the general public. You know, when you bring up Theodore Roosevelt, they might think, you know, Yellowstone national park, but um, they don't understand that or don't know that he and his, his buddy, George Bergernell put together the Boone and Crockett club because they saw these, these numbers of game declining and they wanted to do something about that. Or, you know, with George Bergernell being a hunter himself, starting the Audubon club and the Audubon society and, 
And you which know, now the, must be like what probably ninety eight percent of the folks in the Audubon Society would never even imagine hunting. I would imagine today. Like, yeah, yeah, and 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 so you have all of this institutional knowledge within hunting that um, virtually nobody outside of hunting knows, and then within inside the hunting community, very few people can can tell you who George Bergernell is. But you know, I would argue that if if it wasn't for George Bergernell, there wouldn't be the Theodore Roosevelt that we knew. And, you know, TR was kind of the voice, but Grinnell was the passion behind everything. And not to say that TR didn't have the passion himself, because he certainly did. But, you know, the meeting of those two people and, and, and you know, Grinnell criticizing TR's book and this, you know, passion um, erupting and kind of a, a, you know, disagreement over a review became this lifelong partnership that had that not happened, very likely market hunting could have continued in fair chase when it had been an idea that that was generated by those two and by the Boone and Crockett club and who's now just known for their records and not their conservation history. But, you know, you, you bring up a, a lot of great points that I think should cause us as hunters to, to stop for a moment and think about that and, and where we have been. And, and once you've considered that, like all historians will tell you, you know, you can't know where you're going until you know where mm-hmm. you've been then we can start to begin to have these conversations about being self-reliant, self-sufficient when we're collecting our own food and wanting to do that. But, you know, is there enough game and is there enough opportunity out there for everybody who wants to be self-sufficient to have that opportunity? You know, here in Montana, I I can, and I I haven't bought red meat with the exception of the occasional ribeye for, for, uh, you know, over 10 years now. And I'm very blessed to be able to do that. But, you know, my friends who live back east or in Maine, you know, are you able to have that same kind of lifestyle and that same kind of food procurement that I am? And, and you know, the answer is probably no. And so how, how do we as conservationists and how, does we, how do we as hunters begin that conversation of um, we all want everybody to have an opportunity, but what does it really look like? And, and if we do give everybody that opportunity, does that limit my opportunity even further. And and I I think that's a a real hard conversation that we have to have at some point. Yeah. That's an interesting component too, because I think about, um, well, I I guess another, you know, you brought it before, like a lot of people don't even know that there are seasons or (laughs) limits or they just think like, we're just out there just shooting, you know? So you got like that level of it. And, but actually when you come into the world of it, you see how stratified it is too. It's like, I've got a friend who owns a property, a five minute drive from here. He's got a private, uh, I think it's about 2,000 acres now on a mountainside. He's got, you know, 24 feeders. They all are linked by cell cams. Uh, it's the entire property is posted. Um, so no one hunts there but him and his son. He lets me hunt turkeys there and never going to never gonna let me hunt deer there. Um, it's just him and his son. They shoot nothing under 10 points. <laughs> you know, I mean, they have a private hunting paradise. And then you could go just off the edge of his property and you'll find a guy who maybe lives in a trailer who's just scraping by. Maine doesn't let him hunt on Sunday so he can hunt one day a week. You know, maybe four years goes and he doesn't get a buck because the only tag that he has with his license, you know, it's it's a really stratified world. It's not like we're all doing the same thing, you know, and so opportunity isn't just how many animals are on the landscape either. It's like socioeconomic. It's it's political, it's, it's, you know, access. It's like, there's so many components to this. And now that it seems like we're on a better footing, it seems like there's been a major turnaround in public sentiment recently. And then, you know, I think some uh, folks like Steve Rennell have been a big part of like changing the public sentiment. And now things are, seem to be on an upward trend. And then COVID seeming to be this like unseen force that brought a lot of people back out on the landscape in a really interesting way. Yeah, you know, and uh, I think the food supply issues that happened or sort of early on in that really changed people's perspectives about this because you had people who would say, well, you don't need to kill things to get your food anymore. It's like suddenly I don't hear that from anybody anymore. <laughs> Everybody's sort of like, yeah, that it. was the big thing, right? Yeah, people get it and- now like, oh, my food isn't always might not always be there. So all this stuff going on just to say that it's a really complex world. And then as we bring in more and more hunters that does mean less and less tags. Right. So it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, we talked just before the show, it's like in Maine, you know how hard it is to get a moose tag here. You know, people, a lot of hunters think of Maine as like the primo moose destination or like a very desirable moose destination. You know, 
I have yet to draw. You've been putting in for sounds like decades have yet to draw, yeah. but you can buy a tack here. It starts around 10,000 and usually between tw- 10 and 20,000. So, you know, I have friends who can do that and they'll, they'll buy a tack. Um, the rest, you know what I mean? So there's like access issues on all kinds of levels. I'm not trying to harp on the socioeconomic thing. I just think it's an interesting component that, you know, depending on where you're at, who your friends are, you know, there's like a lot of, yep. there's a lot that, that goes into your access besides just what's public land or how many tags are available. Well, what do we do as hunters though, when the supply chains eventually get, you know, sorted out and, and meat becomes available? Um, and, and we go back to, okay, well now you don't have to hunt because we have meat again. Uh, I think it'll be in the recent memory of some people, but by and large, do we go back to that argument where, um, you know, I, I hunt for, for my own meat, but the argument against that is, well, you don't need to now. And so, you know, pre COVID, that was something that you're right. People were starting to say, well, you don't need to hunt for meat. That's not really a valid reason for hunting anymore. And so we had to start to look then for what, what was, uh, the validity behind our hunting. And I think this is going to be, it's going to be a moving target for as long as there's opposition to hunting. So I guess forever. Right. And, and we, if we look back to what the reasons were from fair chase to, um, to conservation, to sport and now in, uh, self-sustainment, you know, what's the next thing over the, the, the horizon, because those who would challenge our, our, uh, right privilege, um, lifestyle to hunt, they're going to be looking at that same horizon and wondering, okay, what is it that I'm going to have to do? And I'm not saying that we have to be um, have an apologetic for everything that an anti-hunter might come to us for, but we can't be short-sighted to think that they're not going to have an answer at some point. And if we think as hunters, we're just going to be able to go buy a tag, go shoot my deer in the fall, and then hang up my my gun for the next year, you know, quickly we're going to find ourselves outnumbered and outwitted in, in this um, this cause to preserve our hunting heritage. And so, you know, I, I don't know that I have all the answers. Um, I know I have a lot of questions, but I, I do think that as a hunting community, um, we should really be thinking about those kinds of ideas. Well, one of the things that comes up as, uh, you know, as I'm hearing you say those things, uh, I'm picturing um, the size of the community of people. Not Now, these are a lot of communities that are don't necessarily see themselves as one, but I think when you zoom out, it looks like one big community of people who outdoor recreate that aren't hunters and then uh-huh. hunters and anglers, right? So it's like people who hike, people who backpack, people who camp, people who snowboard, people who ski, people who ATV, people who, you know, any number of things that people are doing in the back country now, you know, like the, I mentioned my, my bear hunting mentor, Lawrence, and um, the area we hunt, he calls it the, the last frontier dance, the last frontier, um, the, <laughs> some mountains between New Hampshire and Maine. And, uh, you know, over his lifetime, he, you know, he grew up on a farm there. He lived his whole life there. And he's, <laughs> he says stuff to me. He's like, Dan, these days people show up here, just, they go on the trails to walk their dog. He's like, Dan, they walk their dog. Like to him as a dogman, the idea that people just take dogs on walks for no reason, like blows his mind, you know, like right. he can't, can't get his head around it. Uh, but he's dealt with like, he always ran dogs there. And now he's just running into every kind of, you know, mountain bikers, fat bike tire people, <laughs> like, you know, all these different kind of sports that he's never seen before. Like they start showing up and now he, everywhere he goes, people think he's like abusing dogs and, you know, he's out there murdering bears all day. And it's like, they, the, the challenge that I think, I guess I'll just bring it back to what you're saying is like, how do, how do we get seen as part of the outdoor recreation world and not like this weird subcategory? Because those folks don't see us as part of them. And then when I come out of the woods, like thinking about squirrel hunting this year and kind of coming out onto a trail and passing hikers and they see, you know, it's just a little 22 rifle. Like when I, when I see a little 22 rifle, I think like little plinker, but they see it and, you know, it, it scares them. They're like, oh my God, a gun, you know? So how do we, how do we get like to where we're part of them and not separate from them? And, and, and I guess the bigger question I'll ask you is like, does the, do we need to expand the scope of like Pittman Robinson and see this as like 
do we need to bring these people into the conservation effort the way hunters have been through, you know, the taxation on our gear that uh, funds conservation and, you know. Man, those are great questions, Dan. Um, you know, typically we've labeled that that conversation as uh, consumptive users versus non-consumptive users with hunters and anglers, you know, taking fish and animals out. And, and the reality is, is that nobody who steps foot into the woods or, or into the water is is a non-consumptive user, right? They're all leaving some uh, some form of use behind, whether it's a footprint and those footprints turn into trails, which turn into, you know, eroded goalies or whatnot. There's always going to be some kind of impact uh, on the habitat that's out there. And so, you know, this, it, it's, it's helpful to have those labels just in the, the terms of this conversation, but the moment they become, you know, pejorative or, or some type of uh, negative, they, they cease to be helpful. And, and so I would caution us from saying, you know, it's a, it's an us versus them kind of conversation. And then I would next say that I think hunters really need to stop and remember that wildlife is held in public trust for everybody, not yeah. just hunters. Mm-hmm. And, and as hunters, we're, we're the funding source for that management mechanism. And, and so we, we tend to think that we have a larger seat at the table or a bigger piece of the pie, but the reality in some is, sense is that- we have though, right? Because like like the average mountain biker doesn't know that they could just show up to a meeting um, at their department and be part of the conversation. Like they don't know, like hunters know that the animals are held in trust by us, but the average, you know, backpacker isn't even aware of the existence of Pittman Robinson, isn't aware of the existence of, or doesn't even know how the system is in place. Yeah, you're right there. Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I think wildlife management agencies, um, you know, they, they have efforts to to get that word out. Um, but but by and large, I think most people don't realize that they even have an opportunity to, to do that. And I think hunters as a community, I think we're a little concerned about what would happen if we did. You know, we look at what's going on in Washington right now with the commission and the loss of the spring bear um, hunt there. And, and we're afraid that if we open up hunting in the wildlife management agency to these people who aren't hunters or, or might even be anti-hunting, that we're going to see those same kinds of results. And so we're fearful of our heritage and lifestyle yeah, I, uh, uh, falling away. But the reality is, is, is these, these groups are, are becoming better informed and better involved. And I, I think that's something that we should really start to consider where we've been keeping these people at, at arm's length and telling them, okay, yeah, you might have a valid seat at the table, but you know what? We've got it for 120 years. We've done wildlife conservation. Look what we've got now, more animals everywhere. So, you know, just let us continue to kind of work how we're working. But, you know, at some point we're going to have to lower those walls uh, low enough so that we can hold hands uh, across them and bring those bird watchers and mountain bikers in and say, listen, you know, what you're doing over there is having real effect on the wildlife and they don't know it. You know, studies have been done in the back countries of uh, areas of, of Colorado and Wyoming on mountain goats and what backcountry skiers and snowmobilers are doing to, to impact those populations where they've kind of been reserved in, in the winter time because nobody had gotten back there. Well, now they're having impact and oh, wow. uh, moving I've never those heard of populations. That. Yeah. So, you know, they don't know that. And, and I don't think there's anything that's, that has any kind of malice there, but it's still a real impact on what we as hunters know is a declining population across the West of a very scarce animal anyway. And so, you know, if we don't bring people like that into the fold and say, listen, you know, we want you to enjoy the outdoors. We love enjoying the outdoors, but there's gotta be a way that we, we work together. Um, I don't know what we're going to accomplish in the future. You know, here in Montana, we have a lot of stuff going on and I work with uh, a lot of groups. We're dealing with elk right now and season setting plans and a lot of things and a brand new director and a new direction for everything here at Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And, you know, a lot of sportsmen and hunters not happy about that. And, and I can understand why, but, you know, the moment you start raising the stick at somebody instead of a carrot, you know, you, you don't get as much done. And so where can we find ways to collaborate and cooperate. Those are the two words I like to put out there instead of being combative. That's the other C word that I put out there. And, and, and I think as hunters, we, we need to find a way to say you're welcome at the table. And, and hopefully those people who are traditionally non-consumptive users 
but have a little bit of humility when they come in and say, you know, you guys have been doing this for a long time and we've seen that success. We just want to be part of that. And I, I think at some point we're going to have to take that risk as hunters and say, come on in and, and, and then find a way that we can work together. Because if we don't, I think what we see in Washington could be a precursor to, to far more um, lost battles, in my opinion. One of the things that comes up for me, um, this is like this thing, I feel like it's like taboo to bring it up. I've, I'm enjoying chatting with you because you, you're interested in what's happening at the outer edges um, or the stuff that you're looking under rocks and willing to peer at like what lurks beneath, you know? So um, there's this sense for the non-hunter uh, that the hunters are largely low IQ individuals. <laughs> and the hunters are so often playing into the stereotype. So when you're, you know, jacked up pickup truck with the camouflage, you know, lower border and the, all the buck antlers, you <laughs> stickers and camouflage and the big American flag off the back and all those things. Like, it's funny. Cause like I, I have friends on both sides of this kind of thing. So, you know, th- they, are expressing independence, freedom, Americana, all these kind of things. They don't see it the way it looks to the person who's wearing horn-rimmed glasses, who's got two degrees, who's, you know, works in an office nine to five, who's a little bit metro. And so, like, the person in the truck looks at that person and thinks, oh, like, that person's uh, in a, in a feminine libtard, <laughs> you know, yep. and this person looks at that person and thinks like racist redneck, right? And like, neither of these things are accurate and, but both want to express their, uh, tribal identities. And so they, they both like wear as badges of honor, the thing that is most detestable to the other. Um, but as hunters, like, so, you're not putting off any of that kind of a vibe to me. Like I don't feel from you anything like that, but I do run into some of those folks, you know, where you're like, Oh geez, this person's not a real good spokesperson for what we're doing. Um, that person tends not to be involved in the conservation component of the thing. They tend not to be involved in the education component, but, uh, I hate to say it, but you do, you must know the kind of person I'm talking about. And like, how right. do we self regulate in our own community mm. Because that type of character right now is so easy to point the finger at and we're going to get no support for, you know, and they represent a, a pretty big base. Like, like if you just went to Bass Pro Shop or Cabela's and hung out outside, you would like see what I'm talking about, right? It's like you see, you'd see yep, yep. 20% of the people coming through the door might fit that demographic. And, uh, I don't, I'm not here to judge those people on any personal level, except to, except to say, Hey, this really doesn't land well for the people that we need it to land well, if we want this to be in the future. Because the other thing is, is that person who, who I'm describing is not going to go get involved in the legislative side of this stuff, but that person in the horn room glasses who works in the office might, and they, you know, the power of the pen is mightier than the 12 gauge or whatever. Right. So they might, they might be willing to go out and put some work in uh, where that other person might not. And that, that really concerns me over time is like, how do we, how do we self-regulate and clean up our act so that we're not putting off a cultural vibe that is out of sync with where the world is going. And and not because I can't, not because I think we, not because I think that needs to happen um, on any moral or philosophical level, but because on a practical level, it kind of hurts us, you know? Yeah. You know, I think back to an example that doesn't include trucks and it doesn't include, you know, um, blood on a tailgate and it doesn't include anything else that might just be generally offensive. Not like a set of testicles hanging off the back of a (laughs) trailer ball or anything. Uh, no, but you know, in Wyoming a couple of years ago, we had people that, uh, ran over coyotes with a snowmobile and then posted that on uh, on their social media. That's a good and example. The firestorm, yeah, the firestorm that that created uh, probably did more damage than all the trucks in in the country with all that stuff combined. And it was one post that went viral in such a way that it, it you know, 
uh, anti-hunting groups were able to raise millions of dollars off of that one thing that at the time was completely illegal and then required Wyoming to take legislative action to to fix a problem that should never have happened, right? And and so we talk about self-policing within the hunting community, and I think that that's, that's an idea that has um, – it's really been around since the beginning. Uh, you know, when, when TR and Grinnell put forth the idea of fair chase, they were um, – they were kind of blackballed from the hunting community. You know, people wanted wow. to be able to hunt for their, for their homes. And, you know, the pot hunter um, was mm-hmm. going to be out of a job now. And, and, and so they were, it was really put off um, as something that was extremely offensive within the hunting community. But now today, I mean, it's codified in a law into virtually every um, state regulation with wanton waste and, you know, not using drones with guns put on them and things like that. There's this element where, we as sportsmen choose to self-limit. And so, you know, the idea that we need to self-police as hunters has been around a long time, but I think it's fallen out of favor. We don't want to offend people or there's this idea that, you know, the truth is not absolute and that it's relative to whatever is going on. And, and when you start to look in, in terms of that at hunting, it's just not true. You know, I think uh, I, I can't find one place where somebody said that running over a coyote with a, with a snowmobile is a good thing and should be allowed, Right. That's an extreme case, but what about the the guys that want to throw their buck in the back of the truck and, and let the tongue hang out in the blood and everything for everybody around town and parade that, right? Uh, that's Which something was that, so that, acceptable 40 years ago, though. Like 40 years right. ago, people would have saw that and been like, oh, that's awesome. He got his buck. He's going to, they're going to be eating so good. Like, you know, it's just that times change, right? It's like, it's yeah. not the actual well, and, thing, right? It's not like there's something it, wrong with having your buck. <laughs> you know? If I'm being honest, if I'm driving down the interstate and I see somebody and they've got an elk in the back of their truck and they're coming back from a you know successful season, I'll like honk on the horn. Yeah, it's like hell yeah. Stuff, you know? Like I'm super happy. You know, I'm you. glad for them, right? I mean, right. my truck's empty. I wish it wasn't, but <laughs> right. you know, I'm glad that they found something. Um, but you know, I think, you know, when we talk about just how small of a demographic we are as hunters and how large of a demographic are those who are part of the decision-making process. If we're not careful with that and we're not self-policing other people and saying, Hey, you know, there's a better way to do that and coming at it with some humility and maybe some suggestions instead of telling somebody, maybe asking questions, you know, have you thought about what people might think about that? And, and there's been this great, um, this great wall put up um, by hunters. And I think a lot of it, you know, historically has been because of our, our egos, if I'm being really honest, that, we want to be seen as, as good hunters who provide and are able to overcome these challenges. And, and when you, you start to in any way question how we're doing, we come become really defensive and, and instead of becoming defensive of ourselves, maybe the question needs to be how we can be defensive of our hunting heritage. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, you know, uh, I almost always core my animals anyway, um, usually packing them out. So there's not a lot to hang out of the back of the truck is usually in a cooler somewhere. But when I have those opportunities to to maybe, uh, as I say, elevate your hunting, I, I try to find those ways because, yeah, it's totally legal to do that. But is there a better way that I might be able to present hunting to people so that I might win, if if not converts, then at least people who are are going to be permissible to me hunting yeah. uh, and encourage me to to do that. And so, you know, I I would challenge those who would say that you know, well, I'm going to do it my way because I've always done it that way. That you know, perhaps there's not room in the boat anymore for those types of people. And, and I hate to be that way because I don't want people to, to be forced out of uh, what I love to do and what I'm sure they love to do. But the reality is, is every demographic and every group and every cause has had outliers like that who um, have detracted from what we really want, which is to preserve the habitat and the species that we hunt, to have these opportunities for generations to come. And, and if you think that your freedom and your ability to, to go do what you want with a snowmobile and and predator hunting is, is worth what it might cost later on, then, um, you know, I don't really have time for Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I've always, that doesn't really answer your question though. I don't think there's an answer. Yeah. (laughs) I don't expect you to know, but yeah, I'm thinking of a, of a household. Uh, I mean, every year it's like by the evening of opening day, they always have just an incredible buck hanging, um, you know, out front of their house, but they're right on main street and they are legally allowed to do it, but it sure upsets people, you know, it's like, it's a hard one. It's like, I, I feel celebratory, but I just know that other people don't. And 
I understand the attitude of you don't want to cede any ground. You know, it's like, I feel like this in the firearms debate. It's like, Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to cede any ground because it's such a slippery slope. It's like, you know, you know that the strategy, if you just flip the tables and you're like, Hey, if I wanted to get rid of guns, like how would I do it? It's like, I don't even want to say out loud on this podcast how I do it, but I'll tell you what, I would pick away at it (laughs) little bit by little bit by little bit. And so hence, when I sense somebody's picking away at it a bit by bit by bit, I want to resist every little bit. And so I understand the mentality that's like, hey, I can drive with a deer in my truck if I want to, like I'm just going to do it. But it's like, man, is it, is it setting the right tone, you know? I'll give you another real world example. So over here in Montana, it's wolf season. And thus far we've had a, Ooh, not an average con- harvest on that's wolves. That's contentious, right? man. <laughs> yeah. And, and so we have these wildlife management areas. Uh, they're not areas, they're units, hunting districts, just north of Yellowstone Park and wolves are coming out of the park. They're being harvested. Totally legal, right? And one of the questions I asked, uh, I was talking with one of our commissioners and I had a, a question about um, at what point is – is it worth defending the ability and, and the privilege to hunt these wolves right there where we are perfectly legal, right? Versus the social cost it's having on wolf hunting in general across the country. And, you know, they talk about putting in a boundary or a buffer zone around Yellowstone Park, which I don't think is really helpful. And calling these things Yellowstone wolves isn't helpful anyway. But you have you have a real world um, example of where our fight and our defense of hunting in this particular instance might hurt hunting in a larger way. And mm-hmm. at least is it's acceptance of hunting across the country. And, oh, and so, you know, is it, is it worth having the ability to harvest what, you know, a dozen wolves, give or take, uh, I think it's 20 now in that area um, versus, you know, the, you know, three or so hundred that we harvest in Montana. Don't quote me on that number. I'd have to go look it up to be sure. But, or hunting in Idaho and Wyoming for wolves, the Great Lakes region, uh, going into Alaska for wolves. You know, if, if and, and your average person isn't going to be able to differentiate between these different states and ecosystems for hunting wolves, all they're going to see is that hunting wolves is bad. And and is it worth the the number of wolves? And and so I think as hunters, we need to start to have a little bit more nuanced conversation here. And I'm not saying, you know, um, make a buffer zone and I'm not saying give up wolf hunting and, and I'm not saying uh, that we need to, to backtrack on what we've done for management of wolves. Cause I think we've done a fantastic job, especially here in Montana, but we need to consider that there's a social cost involved here. And do we want to spend that right now? Or do we want to save that for say grizzlies and delisting grizzlies here in Montana and finally having a season and being able for the States to manage mm. those successfully, like we have wolves. And, and again, I think it's, it comes back to, you know, we're as hunters, we're really concerned that if we give an inch, they're going to take a mile. And, and I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think that that's a real fear, but on the other side, I wonder, you know, is it worth giving up a little bit right now so that we do not lose in a bigger conversation somewhere else? And so when the commission voted to kind of pause what, um, right now, I think, instead of increasing the quotas. I think that was a really wise move. And uh, again, I think it comes back to we, we in the hunting community have to find um, where, where these battle lines are and, and what, what we're really willing to fight instead of just um, not finding ways that we might. And I don't even want to use the word compromise because it sounds so, uh, it's nuanced in its own way, but find ways that we can work with other groups and other places so that we maintain and possibly even grow what we have already. Yeah. It's, it's a scary one. Cause it's like, you know, okay, you lose wolves and then, and then, uh, let's say with bears, it's like, okay, well they want to come for the hound hunting. And then it's like, well, they want to come for the bait hunting and then, okay, they want you, they want to stop lion hunting. And then, you know, like piece by piece, you'd sort like whittling down and whittling down. And so it's like, I, I feel so much resistance to giving any anywhere on it, but at the same time, the long game is really important. I think like building allies is going to be so crucial because that's what I was saying before. It's like, it's not hard for backpackers and mountain bikers to get on the same team. You know, it's like, 
it's a natural alliance if you know uh, or any number of you know backcountry users it's like it's that those of us even people who angle i don't understand why angling is seen so favorably by people when it's such a similar pursuit to hunting but it's like the method of the weapon is different i guess you know but oh no i i had a biologist tell me one time it's directly relatable to the length of their eyelashes so the longer the eyelashes <laughs> right, right the more favorable people are so when you know when bambi yeah. looks at you and she, yeah. she flashes those those eyelashes that gets it right and, and fish don't have eyelashes so there's, yeah. your, there's your answer well, and I mean, interestingly, I, I've this is something I've brought up with so many people, and I don't know. To me, this seems like it should have more like there should be more impact to it, but it seems everybody just kind of shrugs it off. But I think it's really strange how we market hunt in the sea still and not, you know, on land. It's like we, you know, we talk about all the changes that happen with market hunting. You know, you've been talking about with Teddy Roosevelt and that sort of the history there. And then you look at what happens in the sea, and I love to be the beneficiary of of commercial fishing. I, I love going out on commercial fishing boats whenever I get a chance to. I'm, um, I, I have many friends in the commercial fishing world, so this isn't an indictment of those folks in any level. I, and I think here in the United States, uh, despite some of the like really awful propaganda films that have reared their head on Netflix in recent years, um, you know we have a very well regulated fishery. But it is interesting <laughs> that market hunting is still rampant in the sea it's like oh well that's fish though so it's like whatever not a big deal <laughs> you know it's like it's just really strange uh you know here yeah, in Maine, it's i was like, in oh go ahead I, I was in western washington this past summer and and um chasing you know kings and and cohos and then we did some bottom fishing and uh i mean i love eating those fish something about saltwater fish they are mm -hmm. uh, they, oh, they yeah. just taste so good and while i was there you know the king uh limit went from two to one and I'm like, well, okay. Um, you know, I can't do anything about that. I wish I could have two instead of one. And, but then I think about all the commercial fisheries and what they're bringing in. I'm like, well, I can just buy a couple more, I guess. But, you know, where is the, how is that equitable? And, and, you know, am I as one fisherman uh, having that kind of an impact and as collectively as, as anglers across the West, are we having that kind of an impact versus the, the commercial operations. And, and to be honest, I don't know, I'm not that versed in, in that world and I'm definitely digging deeper into that, but it's a question I have because um, you're, you're right. You know, the, the scale of which things are happening. I know that they have uh, the biologists have their pull, the pulse on, on those, those happenings, but it makes me wonder, you know, is, uh, is there a way uh, that we can figure those things out a little bit better? And they, they, they are in a very difficult position though, because unlike, you know, here in Maine where it's like, okay, you can fly them, you get in the helicopters, you fly a moose survey, you can get a pretty good sense of how many moose are on the landscape. How do you do that with cod or, or haddock or pollock or tuna? It's very difficult. You're dealing with a resource that you can't actually count. <laughs> You know, you have to do these weird abstractions, like send down a net and then try to extrapolate out the numbers. You know, it's a really difficult one compared to creatures that live on land that you can, that leave so much sign everywhere. Yeah. And I don't know how they do it, but, um, all I'm asking for is for two Kings next year. If they can just <laughs> work that out for me. I'd be right. Ready. Right. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I've, uh, I've found, I, you know, I feel like the more time that goes on, the more I, I feel just really like I have this incredible, um, I hate that word privilege now. I feel like it's gotten all twisted up, but I have this like opportunity, this beautiful privilege to get to make a show, uh, about wild food and, you know, mm -hmm. have it be on television. It's just, but I've also come to understand what a tremendous responsibility it is because anything I show in high definition footage could make such a good PETA commercial, <laughs> you know? Yep. And there's so many things that happen hunting and fishing that you see that are just two, two categories. One is the incredible weird stuff that happens that you just like, that could never happen twice. Like, you know how that's so strange or the stuff that you see that you think, man, humans need to see this because the reason that the person driving down the road can't handle seeing a dead elk in a truck or a deer hanging from somebody's yard is because they, they, the normal desensitization process that humans have always had being raised around not just death, you know, of the animals that we eat, but of each other as well. I mean, you think like when in human history have we ever been so shielded from every aspect of death? It's just like, not, that's not normal. And you would, you would be hardened to it 
over the course, probably by the time you're three or four years old, you'd have seen so many things, you know, whether you grew up on a farm or in a hunting community or whatever it was, you'd have seen so much of this, you know? So there's so many things that, that will, my, my main producer Grant and I will see and we'll think like, that's beautiful. And then we'll show it and people are like, you no, <laughs> no, you can't put that on the air. So like recently, uh, we harvested a bison and there's this scene that we had to cut. You know, my wife and I walk up to the bison to kind of put our hand on it and tears start coming out of its eye. And it is like, it's just this really like, you know, that kind of feeling like everything time stops around you and it just was really powerful tears are coming out and my friend uh travis is is praying in dakota uh, uh behind us and the scene is like it's so moving but like right away we we're told like no you can't air that you know it's going to end up in the wrong hands like you can't and so it's like yeah. oh, it's so challenging because there are things that are really powerful that i wish we could share with the public um but the public isn't really able to digest it <laughs> and well, and i would like, counter Go ahead. I was just going to say, I would counter that, you know, maybe those are the images that the public needs to see where there is this deep reverence for these animals that we pursue that um, you can't understand in any way, except in that firsthand personal account. And, you know, the, the, the traditions that, you know, the, the hunters have had historically after they've killed an animal are really important, you know, with, with the, um, the last bite that in East, Eastern European countries, they would put that, that, uh, sprig of grass into the animal and, and, in their mouth and, and honor that, that, or, you know, you go to any Aboriginal people or Native American culture and there's this, this, um, ritual that they would do where, you know, they would, um, in some way honor the animal. And, and, and I think what, is probably missing in a lot of ways or with the disconnect in social media today, when people just see hero shots and it's grip and grins is they don't see the effort that went in behind it. And they don't see mm -hmm. the immediate reference that's at the kill. And they don't see what happens after that. And all they see is just death and they don't understand that there's, there's so much more that surrounds that. And I think as hunters, we've lost the ability to become those storytellers and we just post the picture cause it's easy. And we put a couple of hashtags cause that's easy, but you know, I, I would argue that some of the best things that you can put out, they might be hard and I'm not a TV producer and I don't have, you know, uh, anything to say in that world for darn sure. But, uh, I, I would love personally to see those accounts. I, I love seeing the pictures when people that, when they send them to me and it's, you know, they're not staged, they're not posed, but man, you can just see in their face and in their posture and the way that they're presenting that animal, that there was something that they recognize was sacrificed. And, and if, if people in the hunting, the, the non-hunting community saw that more, I think we would win, uh, mm -hmm. we would win converts and we would win favorable results towards, uh, what we do as hunters far more than, than maybe anything else we could do. Wow. Yeah. I really appreciate that. You know, uh, there's this film series that PBS made must be a decade and a half ago, but it was uh, three parts. It was called the century of self and it was an exploration of, um, marketing and propaganda that is so hard hitting. I mean, this kind of sounds like it's off topic. I'm going to bring it around here in a second. Very, very powerful. And um, I don't, I'm trying to remember what president was in office at the time. I can't recall, but anyway, his philosophy was if we tell the American people the truth, like they will sort out what needs to be done. Like, so he believed that the newspaper should, should explicitly tell people like what we're really up against. Well, the marketers saw it differently. It's like, because they were really influenced by Freud's work. They were like, no, people are emotional animals and they're like, have a herd mentality and we can just steer them by playing with their emotions. And that has obviously won the day. And, yep. and what you're saying, I like what you just said, because emotionally is impactful because what I want to do, you know, I always think like if I could get people in the non-hunting world to understand one thing, what would it be? And it's like one of the most important things I wish I could just get people to understand is compensatory mortality versus additive mortality. Like if wish people just knew that it's like when I go kill a, a rabbit, I'm not detracting from the rabbit population in the way that people think. It's like, no, a huge percentage of these animals are going to die that year. Whether I take them or a coyote takes them or they starve or they freeze or whatever it is, 
there's a, and biologists are always trying to, as you know, keep our take in compensatory mortality. So the problem would be additive mortality where it's like, Hey, we're taking more animals than can be replenished. And so the population dwindles and dwindles like an overspent bank account. And I think like a lot of people don't understand that they just think we're taking and they, they don't really realize the animals have these short lifespans and that, that this is part of the inevitable, regardless of what, how they're taken out. Uh, and I think like if people just knew that, but in reality, people don't care. They're, they're more affected by seeing that sprig of grass go into the deer's mouth. It's like, oh, that's emotional. They feel that and that impacts. And so it's like, yeah, I do hope that we can get more because I think one of the things is too, it's like you go, let's say you go to post on social media. It's like, who are you posting for? Because if you're posting for non-hunters, yeah, you'd want to show a different thing, but you're also posting for hunters. And and if you just posted all the reverent stuff, you're going to get made fun of and you're going to get laughed at and they're not going to, people are going to like tease you about it and, and talk smack about you because it's like, oh, you're, you know, you're just trying to be pretentious or whatever. But then if you just do the grip and grin thing, you're just turning off the non-hunter. So I'm always trying to strike that balance where I'm like doing a bit of both, like thinking almost, I think I actually probably post like 60 to 75% toward the non-hunter in a sense. Like I lean in that direction because I think it's more important and because I'm not, you know, I'm a relatively new hunter. I'm not good enough to really impress anybody. I'm just not what I'm trying to do anyway. So, uh, but that is an interesting thing. It's like, who are we trying to communicate to? And then like, what's the long-term goal? I think a lot of times, like you were, you brought up the ego piece. That's an obvious thing. It's like people are looking for that immediate sense gratification, which you get by getting the likes. And you, you don't typically get that by being reverent. You, you know, that's not going to, that doesn't speak to a lot of the hunting culture right now. It's like, you don't see that. You know, again, you go to Cabela's, you don't see like wall to wall ads of a guy, you know, petting a deer and putting a sprig of grass in its mouth. You know, they don't yeah, show you that. Yeah. You know, when I think about that question, you know, if there's one thing I could have non hunters know about hunting, I think I go back to the idea that there is this respect and this reverence for the animals that we pursue that, that borderlines on, um, and, you know, Almost in some religious. cases, like, <laughs> yeah, and it, and it does. And, and, and if they were to understand that they would then, you know, the idea of us all being fuds where, you know, we just drink beer and shoot anything that moves and, and we're just careless and, and carefree with, with how we hunt would be obliterated. They would know that there is, there's something more to what this person is doing and, and, and the why behind it. Uh, you know, when you look at old, um, you know, ancient cultures and you talk about hunting, there's no idea there that they were just doing it for, for the antler size or something like that. Almost the opposite. You almost always right. see like we're after the pregnant female cause she has the most fat and because that's what really sustains us, not protein. We actually need the fats, like very little emphasis on, you know, I really got to experience this on my bison hunt just because like learning about it historically, it's like a big bull was not really desirable food. <laughs> Right. Nobody right. wants that to eat, you know. I I and I think when we when we post things, I think we have the ability to tell stories and we we miss that opportunity. And you know, I, I try to be uh again a little bit more educational in what I post when I put something out there. And so, you know, I know a, a lot of the people that follow me and and are within my network, they don't hunt. And and so I try to tell them, you know, when I go do this, what does that mean? Or, you know, uh if I if I'm, uh, you know, I try to post recipes and, and get that food angle so that they, they understand that there's more to it than just the grip and grin. But don't get me wrong. I mean, if you took a look through my, my, my Facebook, you know, I took my dad, um, ice fishing this past year, caught my personal best through the ice rainbow. And, and I'm darn proud of that fish. Right. And it right. ate good. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a story there where there's a family happening. There's a connection being made. Um, there, there's, there's something about the experience there that it's more than just this big fish that, that Everett is holding up, but there, there's, there's, there's something that surrounds it that can be appreciated by all. And I think at its core, hunting has that, um, where there, there's these relationships that we build over time. There's these challenges that we overcome. There's these things that we discover about ourselves or about the creation that we're in that, that everybody can connect to in some way. And, mm. and I think the challenge for us as hunters is how can we put that out there 
And can we do that in the traditional ways that we've done it? Or are there better ways to do that? Or are there um, ways that we can do it where we can win people to the cause of hunting while still promoting the experiences that we've had? And so, you know, going back to the idea of self-policing as hunters, is there a way that, um, you know, we can, we can do that storytelling? And I saw a picture recently of a wolf that was killed and I was okay with that. But in the wolf's mouth was a shell casing. And I yeah. thought, is there really a reason for that? Why, what is it about that picture that you're really trying to communicate to me? And, and as a hunter, I found that distasteful. And so I can only imagine what a non-hunter or an anti-hunter would think about that. And, and so antagonizing you know, I, them really. Right. And, and, and the provocative nature, I mean, if you're just trying to get the most likes for it, well, then maybe you're, you're winning that, that battle, but you know, what that's costing again in the social aspect is, is not worth it in, in any way. And so when I messaged that person, they were really receptive to what I had to say and, and the way I oh, approached wow. it was, how, how did you was really, it? well, I, I think this comes back to, to two things. One is I had a relationship with that person that I was able to, to reach out to them and talk to them a little bit and say, um, what I wanted to say, but they knew that I wasn't coming at them with, um, you know, a sharp stick. I was coming at them with a, a real concern for both their own well-being and their 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 status, but also for for the 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 um, the cause of, of hunting. And so, when we talk about self policing, one of the things I really try to emphasize is that if you're just going to do a blanket thing, it's probably not going to be near as effective as if you have a relationship with those people. And so, I really try to build relationships over long term so that I can have influence in a way that's really meaningful. And, and instead of just going for that short bottle rocket kind of approach, there's this long fuse that burns and, and trying to have influence over time. But that requires a relationship where there's a security um, in, in who you are as a person and a trust between the two people. And then I really try to use some humility there by, by asking questions. You know, it's not that Everett knows everything. It's that when I see that, my, my gut reaction is this. Do you, is that what you wanted? Is that what you want from other people to see? And of course it wasn't. And, and it was off the cuff when this actually happened, but, um, you know, the, the result was that, that a better picture was, was, was kind of, uh, was put up and, and oh, wow. I was able to have a conversation wow. like that. And, and, you know, you're not talking large scale impact, right? But, but that's it how is impacts impacted. happen, you know? Right. And, One and it does, you know, it's that the, yeah, the proverb of how do you eat an elephant, right? <laughs> I think that is where we as hunters, um, really have the most opportunity to have influence is when we have those relationships and we use those connections in that way. And, and I think what you see is this snowball effect where we, we can have change within the community and, and yeah, we have big moments like, you know, the snowmobile and the coyote, but these also, these little moments are also, they're very accumulative. And, and at the end of the day, you know, um, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with any positive change towards, um, the, the cause of hunting. Man, I really appreciate this like thoughtful approach that you're taking. It's uh, this. I've had a lot of conversations on this show now. You know, 150 or something. I don't know. And uh, yeah, this is a really unique one. Um, I like how you think about these things. I, I I hope that it inspires other folks to take a thoughtful approach as well. And and I think like you know, part of it is where you are. I imagine in the journey you were talking about before in those stages of being a sportsman and all of that, you know, it seems like you've, you've been there and you've done that. And so you've had some time to, um, mature through these stages, but it's like, I, I wish that the type of hunter that you are, at least that I'm perceiving you to be, um, if we could shift that stereotype from the, the FUD to like, you know, the way you're approaching it, like, you know, cause I think sometimes if, if people understood, cause when I look at a lot of outdoor recreation, I, I think of that nature sometimes gets used like a stage and it's just really about the person, uh, wanting to do their thing and nature's like, uh, the background. And for hunters, it's like the opposite. Like we're having extremely meaningful interactive relationships with the non-human world. We're having like really powerful experiences with other than human beings and uh, how we interact with them. It's not just the stage upon which we do our play. It's like we're an interactive part of an ecosystem in the way that our activity uh, unfolds. And I like, want people to see that and um, 
and see us as, as more thoughtful because because most of the hunters that I'm around, I mean, I know we sort of self-select by the type of person we are, but, you know, they're more like you are. And um, anyway, yeah, I appreciate uh, the approach. You know, I really wanted to talk to you about of falconry today. So I guess to cue it <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, we didn't um, even get there. Yeah, that's, that's great, though. I really like what we talked about. Um, but would you come back on and we could talk about that? Because I want to... Uh... Oh, yeah. Anytime, man. Okay, cool. So I just want to say, I'll give you a second to uh, wrap a bow on this, but just for folks... Um, who are listening to queue it up for next time, uh, you know, in somehow, in addition to all these things you're doing, you have made time to, you know, work with raptors and to hunt with raptors. And I, I'm just really like blown away by the idea of it. You know, I mentioned before that my intro to hunting was, was largely through, um, you know, hound hunting with, for bear. And I really got to see what it takes to, you know, maintain working animals in the hunting world. It's a lot of energy. I just can't imagine what goes into falconry. So, um, yeah, I look forward to getting to talk to you about that as well. You know, I, I, I told you when we were, we were, before we were recording that I could talk about birds, uh, forever. Right. And I really could, the, the idea of getting into falconry, um, I think is intriguing for a lot of people. Uh, but the, the success rate of people getting into it and, and it's be low. Is, is so fractional. Uh, sure. I get converse, calls and emails all the time. Hey, I'd love to get into falconry. And when I give them the list of things that they have to do before they can even get a bird, it's like, oh, well, I wasn't thinking about that. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I got to tell you, you know, I've I've bred and trained dogs for a long time. And, and I have a Chessie now and and I love training them. And, and, and so, you know, training a bird was kind of a, a little bit of a natural um, uh, development into that and, and partnering with an animal to hunt you know, my whole life is, is about, uh, it's really, uh, I'm kind of, you know, one track, one focus and it's all hunting. Right. And so for me getting into falconry was just another way in that method kind of stage to, to, to hunt. And, uh, I, I love it. You know, they're, they are the perfect predator and, and being able to, to do something with them, uh, is it is intimate and it's exciting and it can be scary at times, but, man to release a bird and then have that bird return to you yeah it is probably the highest high you can have in hunting wow okay so that's a great tease for uh where we're headed i'm, I'm gonna want to talk to you soon and and just hear all about it and uh yeah, I imagine of all the people that listen to that episode, very few of them will ever actually pursue it. But it's just this thing that I'm excited for people to know about. And, and you know, especially um, I like the idea of, the, how do I say this? This is a really ancient thing. So it's always interesting to me to look at when ancient things persist, how they look in the modern world is fascinating. So uh, very curious to hear about that. But uh, overall, I just want to say thank you for uh, this conversation today. I was not what I was expecting. And um, it's, it was very stimulating for me because uh, I, I can't imagine having to give up hunting. I just can't imagine. It's like you're, you know, it's not just like my personal identity that's woven up in it now. It's like, it's the human identity is woven up in it. It's like, so it's who we are, you know? And so the idea that it's at, at risk, uh, in the modern world is scary, but the idea that we could be doing things that put it at risk is even kind of scarier. So, um, yeah, I just think there's something here about how we not just conduct ourselves, but also how we communicate, um, that's so important. So yeah, I'll pass it back to you. If you got any kind of uh, conclusions you want to bring. No, I, I just, I echo the same thought. My wife asked me the question just this last week, what would you do if you weren't hunting? And I, I thought about that for, for longer than I have anything else in recent memory. And, and I couldn't come up with, with what would I do? Would I golf? Would I watch baseball? I, I have no <laughs> right. idea. Right. Um, it is such a part of, of my time and my resource management. It's a part of my identity my passion. It's how I provide for, you know, uh, our food. I, I don't know what I would do with, without it. And yeah, the idea that we're doing something to cause our own destruction really gives me pause. And, and I, I, I think the idea of a more thoughtful, more philosophical hunter, if I can say it that way, mm -hmm. um, is something that we can recover in hunting and, and then utilize in a, in a way that can, can make sure that we, we keep it in perpetuity. Well said, man. Hey, 
I, I, and I appreciate that you say recover because it's not like the idea of the philosophical hunters knew this is something that, right. you know, it's part of our heritage too. Um, tell people where they find you and uh, your podcast, your Instagram, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you can find me on Instagram. I'm at Everett Headley. I don't hide behind anything else. Um, my podcast is called Venery and Veritas. You can find that if you Google it up or Instagram. Anywhere you podcast, and, and if you want to learn a little bit more about philosophical hunting and things along those lines, uh, that's kind of where we dug into. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.